In the Art of Geopolitics series, we will explore what geopolitics is as a practice and then see how it can be operationalized as a tool for statecraft. In this series, we will go through a set of three modules, beginning with an introduction of a model for geopolitical analysis, then linking it with geopolitics as a practice or guide for statecraft, and finally bringing it all together through a case study of the grand strategic competition between Tsarist Russia and Great Britain in the 19th century, also known as the Great Game. In Module 1, we have three goals. We will develop a functional definition of geopolitics as world power distribution. Then, we will introduce Sir Halford Mackinder's views on grand strategy through the pursuit of relative efficiency. Finally, we will link it all together in a model of the geopolitical web of power, which links geostrategy with geoeconomics and geotechnology. So I am your host G.S. Guraya and welcome to the Caspian Report series on the art of geopolitics. So to begin with, we are going to work towards developing a functional definition of geopolitics or the politics of the geo. And this definition will help us to develop a framework for statecraft and policy making, which is our overarching goal. So let us begin unpacking what geopolitics is, the politics of the geo. The geo in uh, geopolitics is derived from the Greek origin word Gaia, which was the goddess of the earth in Greek mythology. And geo, therefore, geo or geo, as you pronounce it in English, means world. And when we put the geo as a prefix to say geography or geography, graphy itself is derived from the Greek word graphica, and that means writing. So just to sort of look at the etymological meaning of geography. Geography fundamentally is writing about the earth. What geographers do then is they write about studying the nature of the earth or of the physical space of the earth to begin with. And geography then, by looking at this meaning of geography through its component parts, it gives us a guide towards developing a functional definition of geopolitics. So we are going to do this. A functional definition of geopolitics would imply then that geopolitics is the politics of the geo or the politics of the world. Now what therefore is politics? Politics is derived from the word politica and the word polit politica was the name of Aristotle's uh, book of the same name. And what this book was, it was in fact the first book of political theory and fundamentally it dealt with the art of governing the polis. It was a comparison of various city-states, Greek city-states, and uh, it also spoke about the best practices amongst those city-states. Now, the word polity, is, uh, which we use for nation-states or any other political group, is of course derived from the word polis. Now, this art of governing the polis, or art of governing the polity, or politics, fundamentally it deals with two overarching goals. It talks about how society is organized and then it talks about how the resources are distributed within society. So say if society is organized into classes of various kinds, uh, into various economic groups, how resources are distributed within those economic groups by the leaders who decide what the politics should be or politicians. So fundamentally this is what politics is. Again, I like to look at it this way. Politics is fundamentally about who gets what, where, when and how and who gets to decide this. So now we are going to begin putting it together. So politics of the geo then or of the geo dimension of the earth's physical space. So again if you look at the relationship between the component parts, politics of the earth's physical space is fundamentally about who gets what, where, when and how of the earth's physical space. Of course, as we stand today, the Earth's physical space has been territorialized into various nation states. Now, this distribution of the Earth's physical space, land space especially, has happened over a period of time. And as an international system, this is what we call, or what Halford Mackinder called the post columbian epoch in world history. This is when almost all of the Earth's political space was appropriated by various political groups, some of them by force, 
and the model of distribution of the Earth's physical space was naturalized by international law, by the beginnings of international law, after, especially after as we approached the First World War and got further and further institutionalized as the system got entrenched as the 20th century progressed. So now we are going to begin engaging with Sir Alfred Mackinder and his thoughts on this crucial transition or transformation. So like I said, Alfred Mackinder in his uh, lecture, The Geographical Pivot of History, which uh, still, uh, still today is treated by many geopolitical thinkers as a sort of foundational work of modern geopolitics, even though he didn't use the word geopolitics. So what he said was that as we approach the year 1900, we are entering a new stage in human history. The previous stage of human history was the Columbian Epoch, which was of course the age of exploration beginning from around the 1500s. And that era has ended around the year 1900. Now why has an era ended? Because in this new era, beginning from the year 1900, we are approaching a time in, world's his in the world's history when virtually all of its physical space has been completely politically appropriated, a lot of it by force. Of course, that was the history of the age of exploration and imperialism. Now, now this international system has been entrenched and further changes can only happen as a result of war between civilized and half, all half civilized powers. Of course, uh, Sir Alfred Mackinder is a product of his times. He is an imperialist. And uh, he uses this language of uh, uh, civilization and uh, etc., which uh, we can ignore as the language of the time. But what is important for us is he saw the world as entering a time when there was an international system. Still, there was a hierarchy of civilized and half civilized powers. But he realized that now changes in the political appropriation of the physical space of the earth can only happen through war and because of this now statesmen had to take certain precautions especially as they decided the trajectories or the politics of their nations now this was important because from now on if anything happened in this international system in any one place or one location in this international system every explosion of social forces instead of being dissipated in a surrounding circuit of unknown space and barbaric chaos again that language will be sharply re-echoed from the far side of the globe and weak elements in the political and economic organism of the world will be shattered in consequence now what does this imply remember i spoke about the world entering an era of an international system now, a system is something that is made of interacting parts. So, earlier in the age of exploration or the Columbian Epoch, if there was a war in, say, one location on the, on the globe, that war could uh, be contained within that space, within the vast open spaces around it. But now, because the world exists in the context of an international system, therefore, rather than going for territorial appropriation through war, statesmen have turned their minds to the struggle for building relative efficiency and they have moved on from the struggle for territorial expansion through force of course this is a transitional phase and uh, they are looking to move on is what uh, sir alfred mckinder implies now of course he is most famous for his dictum of the heartland theory uh, so to say and this this great slogan who rules East Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, who rules the world island commands the world. Now, this theory in itself of the pivot area and the inner and outer crescent is something that Sir Alfred Mackinder comes up with towards the end of his geohistorical exploration. Now, what a geohistorical exploration is, is something that we will go into detail in the next lecture. But fundamentally, this is something that he uses as a sort of case, he presents a formula of world history after his long discussion of how the world has shifted from the Columbian Epoch to the post-Columbian Epoch. So this is something that we are going to ignore for now, but we will return to towards the end of our modules.
Now his Heartland thesis, of course, is like I said, something that he comes up with towards the end. But how he approaches that is through a series of logical steps in which he studies how the history of the world is evolving. And like I said, he came up with this idea that now instead of a struggle through war, statesmen are moving towards the idea of cultivating relative efficiency. And now let us look at how the Russian state of that time was doing it. So the grand strategy of the Russian state, according to him, was to control Central Asia or the heartland of the world island, as he said. Now, how the Russians were doing that was by using the best technology for controlling a landlocked area available to them at the time, sort of cutting edge technology of the era, the Russian railways. Now, let's just look at this passage. So what he says is that the Russian railways have a clear run of 6,000 miles from where Poland in the west to Vladivostok in the east. The Russian army in Manchuria is as significant evidence of mobile land power as British army in South Africa was of sea power. So Russian railways have allowed Russia to create rel relative efficiency of the land similar to the relative efficiency Britain had on the sea. Now, going on, it is true that the Trans-Siberian Railway is still a single precarious line of communication, but the century will not be old before all of Asia is covered with railways. And the spaces of Central Asia, the vast spaces of Central Asia, will be open for geo-economic exploitation and through the use of a mobile land power, a mobile army, Russia will be able to extract the potential in population, wheat, cotton, fuel and metals. So, by building the railways, by through this geotechnological advancement, geotechnology is fundamentally any technology that allows you to control the geo or to master the geo, that is physical space. So by using railways, Russia is able to build a mobile land army used for geostrategic purposes which can further be used to consolidate a geo-economic advantage. A geostrategy fundamentally is the use of your physical force to influence world power distribution, distribution of the world's territory or physical space in your favor. And geo-economics is fundamentally the economic base of power or the economic value of the geo-dimension that you control. So physical resources and how you can use that land to grow various kinds of uh, say wheat, cotton, etc. And how you can extract metals, of course. So this is how statesmen are now building relative efficiency. And Russia is able to build its relative efficiency on land, just like Britain is able to build its relative efficiency on sea. And they can both become great powers in their own geodomains, own, own geodimensions that they control. So this is our grand model of geopolitics. Just like Russia links your technology of the railways to use the geoeconomic advantage opened by control of Central Asia and is able to use a mobile land army geostrategically to increase its territory in Central Asia, which is among the few open spaces still remaining in the world from the perspective of imperial powers, but of course not from the perspective of the natives who were conquered by Russia, but that is something we'll get into in the last lecture of this module. So this is the web of geopolitical power that we are working towards. And this working together, operationalized together, is how in this era of the international system, this modern era, a state or statesman, or politicians can allocate their resources according to these various layers of power and build their own relative power. Now power itself, what is power? Power is at its most fundamental level in politics, in geopolitics, in international relations. The ability of actors to achieve desired goals. Now, This is a broad sort of definition of power. And what those desired goals are means the cultivation of capability, which means mobilizing your political, economic and social capacities, fundamentally mobilizing your geoeconomic, your geotechnological capacities, and working them together to create relative, relative efficiency so you can influence the actions of other actors or control them. 
Now this goes both ways, both mutually reinforce each other. So if you have more capability, you're not only able to exert more control on other actors in the international system, you're also able to resist their control. So cultivating your capability, cultivating your relative efficiency is how you prevent another power in the international system, or the actor in the international system from influencing you. And how you cultivate that power is of course, you use the space, the geo dimension of the earth, that is earth's physical space that is available to you. You realize the potentialities of the geo dimension of the space that you control and you cultivate relative efficiency. If Russia, for example, cultivated its relative efficiency on the land, instead of trying to compete with Britain on the sea, where Britain had relative efficiency, they are using their resources, I would say, in a more smart way than, say, Germany tried to do by building their submarines and trying to wrest control of the seas from stronger sea powers. So fundamentally, this is how you have to understand politics in the modern era. These dimensions of power, these various dimensions of power are linked together in a complex web. Now, fun, what a web is, a net, if you pull one aspect of this web, it affects all the other aspects. If you ignore one aspect of this web, then it is going to have a detrimental effect for other aspects. Now, geopolitics, like I said, uh, is about world power distribution and uh, it refers to two aspects, distribution of power amongst various actors in the international system and distribution of the world's physical space itself, how much territory and what territory these actors control. Right, so that is fundamentally what geopolitics is. It is mutually dependent, it's linked in a complex web of power, the geostrategy. Geostrategy is the formulation of and planning of grand strategy. It is the use of military operations on a grand scale and tactical plans on specific scales, or specific terrains and specific, specific spaces and specific places in the world. So military operations on a vast scale and tactical plans on a more limited uh, scale. For territorial control, which means both for defending your territory, controlling your own territory, Remember capability and control, controlling your own territory and in certain cases for expanding your territory. Now that is dependent on geoeconomics. And geoeconomics is the use of economic means by international actors to structurally influence world power distribution. We discussed power to increase your capability or to try and increase your ability to control other actors. And this again is linked with geostrategy and further linked with geopolitics. Because of course you need economic resources to be able to uh, build your military power and you need uh, your military power to be able to increase your territorial control. And what is in my view the most important aspect of this entire relationship is geotechnology. Now you can be a strong geostrategic actor only if you are technologically more advanced than your competitor or at least if you are relatively more efficient in the aspect or part of geo dimension that you control. Now this geo dimension is something that we will continue exploring in our next presentation and uh, we will link our model of the web of power, the web of power model with another model of understanding this geo dimension in a more nuanced sort of way. So thank you for watching and look forward to the next part in the series.